I will be talking about um, global things, of course. Um, today, wh what unites cultural producers and artists from different parts of the world is the fact that we all work under, under uh, global conditions. And what are these global conditions? Global capitalism, the internet, global warming, and so on are certainly the part of the definition, but these things in themselves do not tell us very much if they are not understood in relation to the local spaces that are being transformed uh, by such global conditions. What is more, it is only in the context of the concrete local environment that it becomes clear that these global conditions are of greater benefit to some and less benefit to others. They benefit those who already wield power, while others can only struggle against global domination. But what is true of both groups is that is the fact that they need transnational networks of alliance in order to operate. And these networks can be quickly replaced by new ones. The only constant is the networks themselves, the networks as dominate, dominant mode of contemporary operation. The question I wish to discuss in my presentation is, how much does our growing tendency to work in networks contribute to alienation of our language? Or is the very opposite happening? Are these networks with their different collaborations actually returning the body to language? The art world today depended on various networks, and not just the networks through which art crafts circulate, but now, even more importantly, networks of information and knowledge. Art world networks involve, uh, involve an entire army of experts from around the world. And thanks to new technology, this knowledge is now more accessible to everyone, as we know. But the problem and inconsistency of these networks is that they are still much too closely tied to the central producers and their sources of funding, and consequently, so is the accumulation and processing of knowledge which then takes place in accord with their protocols and priorities. Such networks would be more equitable if they were made up of a large number of self-assured producers from variety of cultural environments. But it would be too idealistic to expect, to expect this given that to expect this, given that there is nothing close to an equal level of development uh, among local conditions. In European Union, there are many efforts to make its different regions more equal in these terms. That is possi possible to, uh, to receive funding for different cultural projects if co-producers from different EU countries are working together. Such EU funding programs have positive influence on a region, a region's economic development by connecting cultural projects with investments in infrastructure and even with employment. Among other things, their goal is to form a common European cultural space. Europeans themselves, however, have very different ideas about what this means based on their different historical experience and present situation. 
nor does the current picture of Europe with its growing nationalism, populism, and even fascism show much success in developing the common cultural space. There is also the fact that Europe is divi divided between the EU and non-EU countries, which have not yet met its criteria for membership. The Schengen border runs along Slovenia's southern border. I hope you know a little bit about, uh, of course, former Yugoslavia and Slovenia being uh, its uh, northeast, westernest part. So the Schengen border runs along Slovenia's southern border, which thus separates a borderless Europe from the other countries of former Yugoslavia. Cultural projects in countries that are not part of the EU must then depend primarily on national budgets. And almost as a rule, the poorer these countries are, the more state money is spent on developing newly devised nationalistic histories. In the Balkans, radical nationalism goes hand in hand with strong historical revisionism, which means in particular erasing all positive aspects of socialist period and demonizing it. The most extreme example is Macedonia, now called North Macedonia, where enormous sums of money have been spent of me megalomaniac national nationalist monuments and museums. A few years ago in Skopje, the capital, where the national museums of modern and contemporary art are literally falling apart, some new museums were built, including Museum of Macedonia, so sorry, this is, um, the Macedonian struggle of sovereignty and independence, also called Museum of the Victims of Communist Regime, which distorts this socialist history to such a degree that it reduces it to nothing but violence against those who were fighting for national independence. So this, this is from the museums, and it's, these are contemporary artworks that you can see uh, painted by, it's very interesting, Russian painters. So the museum invited the Russian paint, painters to depict the nationalist uh, uh, Macedonian history. Uh, Modernist architecture, which was recently presented in the frame of the exhibition here in uh, MoMA. So this modernist architecture built under socialism is today covered by pseudo-classical facades as if to, the, to stress the idea that socialism was a deviation from the path of a great European culture. A similar historical revisionism is happening also in countries within the Schengen borders. One of the, most, of the worst examples of such revisionism is taking place in Hungary, where plans are being made for a monument of national, of national unity in uh, Budapest, to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the Treaty of Trianon in 2020. This will be a 100 meter long plaque on which will be written the historical Hungarian names of 12,000 municipalities, both those that are today still in Hungary and those now belong to other countries, but were once in Hungarian part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. These include the names of Croatian, Voivod Voivodinian, Slovak, and even Slovene Slovenian towns and villages. It is frightening the way nationalism in Europe in the recent years has taken the form or, of territorial treats threats reminiscence of the 1930s. 
As we know, Hungary was also the first country to set up a razor wire fence on its southern border to keep out refugees, but not long afterwards, Slovenia, with the tacit support of Brussels, followed its example. In Slovenia, which has been a member of the European Union since 2004, and is geographically the westernmost country on the territory of former Yugoslavia, people tend to mock the new Macedonian Disneyland and take much less extremist positions when it comes to safeguarding of the national heritage. But even here, there are those who would like to skip past of uh, the country's post-war socialist history. For many, the independent country of Slovenia, founded in 1991, represents, among, among other things, the victory of Slovene, Slovenian language and national culture. But what they fail to see in this connection is the fact that, where, that here a different logic began to dominate, the, the logic of foreign investors and transnational capital. The financial policies of the EU are also dominated by international monetary fund. This was evident particularly during the recent financial crisis, which led to drastic reductions in the national budgets for culture. In addition, local authorities of often seize on the opportunity to acquire European Union resources without, however, coordinating this with their own priorities or missions of, um, of the institutions. We are one of, those, of these examples. So let me illustrate uh, this uh, using my own museum as an example, namely the Museum of Contemporary Art, Metelkova or Masum, how we pronounce. The museum, which houses the artist's 2000 plus collection, the Eastern European collection, operates as a part of the Moderna Galleria, a national institution. We opened, we opened Museum in 2011, that is to say, right in the middle of the recent economic crisis. Although we received EU regional development funds for the museum, our national government failed to designate any money for the museum's program, which meant in practice that we began our work in our museum with uh, no money for exhibitions or even running costs such as water and electricity. So the The architecture of the museum, so the museum is actually the architecture, uh, it's a renovated former Yugoslav army barracks. So the, the picture before showed the original situation in 2000 and this is already the renovated um, thing. So the architecture of the museum, meanwhile, was determined almost more uh, almost more by the deadlines and the, an inflexible financial framework than by content of our program. The, this bureaucratic logic left the building with a larger, large number of non-logical non, uh, non features which we, its users, are still trying to fix. Artists, too, are helping us. For example, we invited the Croatian artist, Marco Sanchanin, for instance, who has been making corrections to useless infrastructures, senseless fittings, and poorly defined spaces to which he gives new meaning. He does this not by providing them with any new content. Rather, Sanchanin simply observes the things that happen spontaneously in this sense. For example, so 
So, for example, one such pointless area in the basement has been colonized by the cleaning staff who take refuge there during the day to enjoy their coffee in peace. Spaces like this quiet corner Sanchanin calls crypts, that is, spaces with no clear purpose where things can happen that are possible, possibly not allowed or least not defined in the official program or the mission of the museum. These scripts then mark spaces without names. So the spaces where museum, museum can be reinterpreted itself over and over. And in our context, what might such reinterpretation mean? I explain it as a re-examining how much certain language is still appropriate for a specific reality. We live in time of extremes, a time of not only strong global and transnational interconnections, but also virulent forms of nationalist hatred towards everything that is foreign. While the transnational networks use a language that is ever more generalized and not intended solely for specific spaces, the jargon of nationalism is populist and adapted to local needs. And local populations have no trouble understanding it. The transnational art world like to think of itself as progressive, as constantly engaging in the battle against neoliberal capital, against existing canons, and for greater justice in general. The art world is dominated by leftist jargon and filled with the words like anti-global, anti-liberal, decolonial, the common good, etc. The ideas these words describe have led to numerous exhibitions, articles, and conferences, and also shape, shape the way museums are supplementing their collections. With so many projects of these sorts, which have diverse and sometimes even ideological oppo opposed um, <coughs> producers, standing behind them, these words are becoming more and more abstract and frequently degenerate into trendy buzzwords. One of the core questions that art and its institutions must address today is how to bring back the, the work and language from which we feel alienated. This is something the Italian Marxist theorist and activist Franco Bifo Berardi writes about. In his book, The Uprising on Poetry and Finance, uh, he notes that neoliberal capital is, by, is based on abstraction of language. Today, in the age of digital abstraction, information has replaced things and bodies. Berardi ascribes a special role to art and poetry, which are able to return the body to language. I quote, poetry is singular vibration of the voice. The vibration can create resonances, and the resonances may produce common space. Different voices uh, that can create common knowledge is what we in our institution particularly wanted to underscore in the long-term project Glossary of Common Knowledge, which the Moderna Galleria is organizing as a part of International, a confederation of seven European museums. Launched in 2010 in Ljubljana, the confederation has, among other things, assigned itself the task of working with neglected history, developing a common knowledge, opposing hegemonic position, and respecting horizontal collaboration. 
The glossary of common knowledge is being created as a transversal project that brings together narrators, that is, those who propose terms for the glossary, not only from the museums of international, but also from other contexts in various parts of the world. The glossary does serve as a kind of platform for, tr for translating between different social, political, and cultural contexts. Unlike other kinds of translation between different contexts in the glossary project, in the glossary project, this happens through the active participation of narrators who are physically present in separate at separate seminars. So, these seminars are devoted to different referential fields such as historicization, geopolitics, subjectivization, other institutionality, the commons, and constituencies. At the seminars, each narrator presents a term that, in their view, best describes the given referential field. The referential fields are essentially umbrella terms which in many cases come from the art world jargon, as I was talking before. And the narrators, with their own particular terms, give them a more individual and contextualized uh, understanding. The term proposed by the narrator then enters a process of discussion, a kind of collective, collective editing through which in it may be altered or at least made clearer. The title narrator, of course, is connected with oral histories, that is, with histories that have not yet been written down, at least not in the way histories have been written for those who have power over the written world. But here we are not speaking about some dichotomy between between voice and the written word. After all, the terms that are proposed are themselves informed with the same contemporary alienation of language. Returning the body to language does not mean restoring the original source of language, but rather treating language as a social practice. What emerges from among different voices of the narrator scene is in fact the body of language. The narrator's voice is not the authentic voice, but rather a voice set in constant tension with other voices as well as with writing. Understood in this way, the voice of narrator retains its point of uterance, which in our global world and its networks we must be ever more conscious of. As curators, we often face dilemmas about how to participate in global exhibitions without at the same time losing our point of uterance. Last year, I took a part in the project Hello World in the Hamburger Bankhof in uh, Berlin. It examined about the role of museums, and German museums in particular, in the global world, of course. This enormous project was composed of 13 separately curated chapters devoted to different cultural contexts from all over the world. This also included the German context as a large part of the project focused on self-reflection of National Gallery in Berlin in relation to its own museum policies and questions about how to move forward, how in the future it could more fully take in, uh, into account non-Western world. I curated a chapter devoted to Eastern European art collectives, oh, sorry, this which I titled Sites of Sustainability, Pavilions, Manifestos, and Crypts. 
I presented mainly post-war avant-garde groups from the territory of former Yugoslavia, groups that had, through their work as collectives, developed a kind of parallel infrastructure, and through this, a certain sovereignty vis-à-vis -vis the authorities, a kind of self-rule, or to put it, in it better and more in keeping with Yugoslav political history, self-management. Artistic collectivism also meant allegiance to a common idea, an, a, an allegiance that in a socialist reality existed only on the declarative level. We could say that these art groups gave body to ideas of socialism that had been degenerated in political reality. Thus, Collectivism acquired its own territory, a point I try to emphasize by installing the separate art collectives, like uh, you can see from the beginning, Exat, uh, uh, the Croatian group, Exat uh, 51, Gorgona, New Tendencies, Oho, NSK, Neue Slovenische Kunst, and others. I can slow. Gorgona. Each of the group in its own pavilion, which, uh, with a design that uh, was based on the original ideas of the given group. The pavilions designed the relatively autonomous territories of these art collectives, which were possibly possible only because these artists had worked on sustainable principles for collaboration, self-organization, their own economies, and local and international networks that, of course, they created. At the same time, these pavilions acted as metaphors for cynical way we approach the sovereignty of individual cultural spaces, which nobody really believes anymore even though we, conti we continue to present such spaces as sovereign and distinct. The most obvious, of course, example is a Venice Biennial. But this cynicism is found not only in the pragma pragmatic manipulation and marketing of the cultural differences, it also lies in our tendencies to conceal why cultural spaces are, in fact, different. They are different primarily because of their material conditions and their relations to power, of power. It is on this basis, then, that we should rethink the idea of the global museum, which the world's cultural capitals, especially, are striving to realize and with the help of art from different spaces, we should show just how this world, in fact, operates. Why there are differences between North and South, East and West, and why these differences are reproduced by global capitalism. In this way, the pavilion is a metaphor for a space that is not completely autonomous, but always exists in relation to some much bigger architectural structure, which in our case means the no dominant social and economic system. The pavilion is a space where the powerful dump their problems, but it is also where different ideas can take shape and confront each other. When we at the Moderna Galleria began asking how we could engage in more equal exchange of ideas on the global level and do this from within condition that in Slovenia, uh, that in Slovenia are set by uh, what is predominantly state funding and very low budgets. We discovered the answer precisely in the tradition of these local avant-garde and their sustainability. One could say that our museum internalized these art groups' principles of sustainability. So this was already shown. 
so the Moderna Galleria understands itself today as a sustainable, not global, but a sustainable museum. Perhaps this idea is more easily understood in the relation to other existing museum models in this uh, scheme, such as Global Museum, which um, replaced the Universal Museum. The last is the uh, artistic project. The Sustainable Museum is a museum that has its own body. In other words, it has its own constituencies, its own local community with whom it constructs its context. And it has its own international networks, which developed on the basis of the similar visions of the partners involved. Here, in the Confederation International is particularly important as a network of equal producers in which each of us speaks on our own behalf and nobody represents anyone else. The Sustainable Museum is a museum that does not merely accumulate, but primarily processes the knowledge and experiences that are brought together in its space. Unlike the global model of the museum, which in its drive to collect art from the entire world will predictably become unsustainable the Sustainable Museum is focused on the micropolitics on, of local to local dialogues. While the idea of the, of the global world, given the size of this world, can only be a construct, the Sustainable Museum examines the differences between this construct and individual local realities, the differences between abstraction and individual bodies. Thank you.